Welcome to La Trobe Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Centre's um, Coffee Catch-Up. Um, we're very excited for this to be the second uh, one in our series of being able to provide you the opportunity to ask questions of our researchers at the centre. So um, one of the things that we, why we designed these sorts of sessions is that it's a very Melbourne thing for us to catch up over a coffee, pick someone's brain and try and ask all the questions that we really want to know and try and learn from each other over a cup of coffee. So we wanted to give that opportunity to all of you, um, especially in the current situation where we are all a little physically distanced and socially isolating ourselves. Um, so today we're actually lucky enough to have Dr. Christian Barton, uh, from a postdoctoral researcher from the centre. So thanks for joining us, Christian. Thanks for having me, Sean. Um, I'm just disappointed I'm not catching up over a beer and this time it's coffee, unlike your session. I know, we sort of thought that maybe our sort of North American friends and our European friends can um, partake in a beverage, but maybe a little bit early for us at 10 a.m. I'll, I'll stick to the cup of tea. <laughs> Brilliant. So I just wanted to go through a bit of housekeeping before we actually get into the Q&A session. Um, firstly, we're going to do about five, ten minutes of an introduction of some of Christian's work relating to running injuries, um, running injuries and managing risk. Uh, then we're going to give you about 30, 35 minutes to ask you all, the, uh, all of your questions. Um, from that, we'll do a uh, sort of closing, uh, five minutes of closing and then we'll be done in 45 minutes. So. In terms of being able to ask your questions, can I ask you to please use the Q&A function? And in the Q&A function, we'll be able to, you'll be able to upvote questions that you really want to know the answer to. So if that someone's asked a similar question that you really want answered, make sure you upvote it and um, we'll be able to see it higher in our feed. Um, I will potentially go to you during the session to uh, sort of uh, get you to ask your question and unmute yourself. Um, so please be ready and keep it short. We do have one thing around the questions that we do want you to ask though. Can we please not present a case study or start your question with, I have a patient that has. We want this to be a really global discussion and really um, co uh, cover off a number of broad topics uh, that we're covering today. So having said that with all the housekeeping, um, Christian, we're in isolation. Normally, we, you and I would go down to the House of Cards, the cafe at La Trobe and have a coffee, but we don't have that opportunity. So all I can offer you today is either a coffee from Starbucks or an instant coffee. Which one are you going? I'll just take a probably a cup of tea from Starbucks instead. A cup of tea. Okay. Are we just talking a uh, green tea, uh, English breakfast? What are we talking? In, probably an English breakfast, Sean. Okay. Yeah. Very, very nice. Very uh, uh, very good. But, but in saying that, Sean, really importantly, I'd prefer you take me to a different cafe. It would be nice for, <laughs> for a good latte. Exactly. Um, and what's one of your favourite things to do over a coffee or, or your English breakfast tea? Um, I think for, if it's tea, it's really just about sitting and relaxing and even sitting there having a chat to my young kids. I do that each morning over a cup of tea normally. Um, coffee for me is often about zoning out and actually getting some work done. Um, so switch off internet and switch everything off, have a cup of coffee and sit down and try and use the caffeine to inspire me to get some writing done, some of my research, which is always a struggle in balancing clinic and research and then actually writing up what you do. So that's coffee's my inspiration. Brilliant. It's sort of, we sometimes expect a lot from our cup of, cups of coffee sometimes when we sit down to write. <laughs> yep, I agree. So I suppose the first question I have for you today is that with us, with gyms being closed, with competitive sport being cancelled, running's become cool again. We, we, you just need to look at uh, Latham's Facebook page where we're trying to run around Australia and sort of someone like Christian Benello is actually running negative kilometres. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you is you only have to do a cursory Google search and there's a plethora of information about types of running techniques yeah. and what is the right technique to not only perform but to not get injured. So I suppose my question to you is, is there a right running technique and or is there a running pro, uh, biomechanic profile that's more susceptible to injuries than not? 
Yeah, so the, the short answer is there isn't one way to run. Um, I have a motto that life is a bell curve, and I think we have some really good examples of that. Um, you, if you want to look at uh, a running technique that would maybe make a lot of clinicians cringe because we have biases, just uh, Google Prakash Jeptu, who's an Olympic silver medalist at the London Olympic Games. And if you watch her run, she has all the biomechanics that we theoretically think might be linked to injury, injuries like lots of hip adduction, pelvic drop, foot pronation, et cetera. But that's probably normal for her. And if we start trying to play around with her mechanics, we might actually injure her in the first place. Equally, you see some people running in community who look like they've got this textbook perfect running pattern and they're actually quite slow. They're not very efficient and they will break down with injuries because at the end of the day, the, the most important thing that dictates load going through our body when we run is, is actually how much running we do. So in terms of volume, so frequency of running, distances of running, and then also the intensity of running. So that can be both the speed we run and, and also thinking about different terrains we run. And people get very obsessed with trying to to put people into a certain box that we should run with a certain strike pattern or we should run with this certain pelvic position or trunk position. But the way we run in reality is dictated by our structural makeup. So if we've got a structural um, variation, that would change the way our, our hips might collapse. And I think you use hips as a good example for that, Sean, because a lot of people get very focused on seeing maybe knee valgus. And one of the really key things with that is seeing quite a lot of knee valgus for some people. If we talk about that bell curve and let's put them on the right hand side, they might have 15 or 20 degrees of knee valgus when they run. But that's structurally how they're built to run. And if we start trying to put them into what we consider as textbook normal, we may potentially actually injure them. And that's really important. Uh, equally, though, we might see some people who have what is textbook normal running, um, but for them, because of their structural variations, that might actually be an abnormal pattern for them or not abnormal, but putting a lot of load on, on their tissue. So it's really hard to try and identify a running technique that would reduce our risk of injury. And from a performance perspective, perspective very similar I think there's a few things I often consider from a running technique that we can maybe change or modify or manipulate that would be safe to do which theoretically might help with injury or an injury prevention and injury management and might also theoretically help with performance and the key things around that are very simple things so focusing on sagittal plane because if we focus on sagittal plane, we're less likely to break people. So things like step rate, which people get really obsessed with, and there's this magic number of 180. For the vast majority of recreational runners, they'll sit well below that. Um, just telling them to get to 180 is not that sensible. Maybe building their capacity to do it through gradual training and maybe some strength and conditioning and maybe some gait retraining too, that might be helpful. Landing position, so we know that if you land further out in front of your centre of mass, you have a have high ground reaction forces. Now, that might be fine for some people who can absorb those loads, but if someone is unable to absorb those loads, then certainly using gait retraining to get them landing closer under their centre of mass. And that can be from step rate or sometimes more proximal cues and other things might be useful. And in theory, if we can reduce those braking forces, so get them landing closer under their hips, that might also help with performance. From a performance perspective, um, certainly we see the, the really elite runners have high cadence, as we suggested, but they also have this ability to generate power. So they're able to get high hip and knee flexion through swing phase, and they're also able to get um, a lot of hip extension and knee flexion during terminal stance so they can propel themselves forward. So when I'm prescribing exercise and maybe gait retraining, that's the sort of things I'm focusing on because by addressing that with strength and conditioning work and maybe changing mechanics, I think we can do that very safely and we're not going to necessarily break people. Whereas some people will play around with gait retraining, like changing strike pattern, for example. Um, and there's this big theory that that will help with our running performance. It would help with reducing injury risk. But what we see in the literature is that changing strike pattern may actually increase our risk of injury because we're shifting a lot of load down to the foot and ankle. And when we look at a running performance perspective, there's no evidence that changing someone's strike pattern to a four foot strike. So from a heel strike to a four foot strike would actually help with performance either. And in fact, doing it in the short term would have a detrimental effect on their running economy. And we've just published a systematic review on that recently. And actually just this week, James Alexander had a uh, infographic accepted in BJSM talking about that topic as well, that myth about strike pattern. That's a longish answer. I could go into a lot more detail as well, Sean, but um, the short answer is there isn't one way that we need to run. Fantastic. And I think sort of for those who remember Cliffy Young in his gumboots in the old Cliffy Rung sh Young shuffle, it sort of that got him to point A to point B and ran ridiculous kilometres with very little injury. 
Yeah, so, so the international guests who are not familiar with Cliff, he won the very first Sydney to Melbourne ultra marathon. He did it in just over five days and he won it because he was amazingly conditioned to running. He spent all day running around his farm in his gumboots. Um, and I often like talking about him because the other controversial topic can be shoes and shoes can definitely affect injury and performance. Um, but equally, you can run in anything you like. And Cliff Young's a good example of that, running his whole life in gumboots and being perhaps the greatest ultra marathon runner we've ever had in Australia. Yeah, it's definitely worth a YouTube look at his running style. So just for all our participants out there, make sure you're getting your Q&A questions in at the moment in the, that section because we're going to be coming to you very soon and asking some of your questions from Christian. Um, so Christian, you sort of went through about that a bit about running retraining and running retraining is this sort of umbrella term, but it fits in a lot of different components. And there's a lot, lot of ways you could, that you could actually implement and do running retraining. So you covered a little bit of this in your editorial at Physical Sport and Therapy. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the acronym RISK that you came up yeah, with. Yeah, sure. So I've become very interested in running retraining probably around... 2010 when I was first in London um, and I had some exposure and spent some time with Irene Davis um, in her laboratory and she was doing some running and training and I found that really fascinating interesting and spent quite a bit of time with Rich Willie and I've continued to spend a lot of time with Rich doing research and looking at this concept about changing technique and using that to manage injury so I started playing around with the clinic um, and I would often see some patients who would maybe have done different exercise programs and other things and they'd do really well um, with this alternate approach of doing running with training. So I'll use, to bring into the risk concept, I'll use a simple example of patients who might have anterior shin pain, pain and they might have sometimes diagnosis of compartment syndrome. So they've got this excessive pain in their anterior shin with running, it's increasing and escalating as they keep keep running and then they're unable to run any further. So some of the early patients I started using this with was those types of patients and I found some really good effects and benefits because we would shift load away by changing their strike pattern. So I just used that as an example before. But equally, I also found that I would try changing strike pattern and actually in some cases I would break them, right? So we'd change their strike pattern and they might end up with some forefoot pain or they end up with some calf pain and I would change strike pattern maybe for a knee injury and the same type of concept would happen. And I would look to the literature and I'd look to other experts in the area and they would say, well, changing strike pattern should reduce or prevent injuries. I was like, this is sort of counterintuitive to me. Um, it doesn't seem to be happening uh, clinically. It seems to be maybe causing injuries as well. So I started to really explore this through doing some comprehensive systematic reviews. And then I also did a study looking at um, interviewing experts around the world. So we spoke to 16 experts who did research in running or training and also used it in their clinical practice. Um, and started to get an understanding that actually there's so many things we can do with gait retraining. And I started working with running coaches and I have a lot of credit to pay to them that I've learned heaps from running coaches as well. And some really good running coaches seem like they did really sensible things with runners that didn't actually cause them to become injured. They not only help their injuries, but they also would often anecdotally lead to performance improvements. I started thinking about that. And over time, I, I developed a framework that I tried to put both gait retraining, but also other interventions I'd provide runners with into, and, and that's a concept of risk. And so what I wanted to get an understanding of is what is safe and what is the most effective things that we should do with our injured runners, and then what are some of the things that might be effective, but we really need to be a bit cautious of. So the analogy of risk is really simple. And and that is the first couple of things we really need to consider with an injured runner who's coming to us is we want to reduce their overall loads. Typically, they're doing too much too soon or they're overtraining. And so if we can reduce their overall loads, then that's the most simple strategy and the safest strategy we can get them out of pain. And when we talk about reducing overall loads, we don't want to stop them from running necessarily. So it's just reducing their volumes. From a gait retraining perspective, if we can find strategies that might reduce overall loading, so let's say increasing step rate or other strategies where we can get them landing closer under their center of mass, their tissues overall have to absorb less load. So that's a really sensible and safe option we can do. Runners don't like to reduce their loads typically, so that typically takes a lot of education, um, but it's really probably the most important thing we can do in the early stages. The second component, which takes a little bit more time and a little bit more patience and links in, is we then need to improve their capacity to handle the loads of running. And we can do that through a few different strategies. So the first broad strategy is once we've reduced their load to a manageable level, we would then gradually increase their training volumes again. So gradually building them back up. And I think most people do that. And most people do that naturally. Um, so we can gradually introduce more 
trading load through duration, through frequency, through speed. And over time, our tissues are living things, so they'll adapt to those additional loads over time. But the other thing that we need to consider is how can we improve capacity of specific tissues? So this is where exercise becomes really important. So you might have someone who's had persistent patellofemoral pain for the past 10 years who keeps running and then not running and then running and then not running. We know that there's not necessarily hip weakness as a risk factor for developing patellofemoral pain, but we do know that hip weakness and particularly loss of power, and we'll circle back to that maybe a bit later, and rate of force development, you have these significant reductions. Now, just telling someone to increase their running gradually probably won't address those isolated deficits. So what we need to consider is can we introduce a training program or an exercise program to restore that muscle capacity, so improve their capacity through exercise, but equally, we might also want to improve their capacity to tolerate load through that patellofemoral joint again as well. So that might be gradually loading that through quadriceps exercises and thinking through isometric. So you can take some of the tendon concepts and go isometric exercise for patellofemoral pain, starting with that, working to isotonic. And then you can actually do rate of force development type exercises with that as well. So while someone's doing less running, you're equally trying to build up that capacity that they can handle load. If we do that sensibly, um, they're very safe things to do and we're monitoring pain as we go along. And if you get those two things right, you probably don't need to make dramatic changes to running technique, which may actually cause inadvertently other injuries. So that's the R and the I of risk. The S is for shifting load. So a lot of gait retraining strategies that we do, even if we do increase step rate, for example, which a lot of people consider safe, that would shift load somewhere else. So we know that when you increase your step rate, it requires greater muscle activation and capacity of your hamstrings and your gluteal muscles, for example, because you have to decelerate that limb and you have to reduce your contact time on the floor to do that. So people often complain that they've got sore hamstrings when you increase their step rate. So you need to think logically about that. Why is that? Now, arguably, that's probably not unsafe. But another example, which is something that can be more problematic of shifting load, would be changing strike pattern. So we might take someone from a heel strike to a forefoot strike or a midfoot strike to try and shift load away from their knee. And that might be really beneficial and helpful for the knee. But if we do that too quickly and we do that without some thought, we might actually cause a new injury, like a stress fracture, for example. And we all saw the big burst in injuries from born to run when people all started getting up, getting their shoes off and running forefoot strike. And the pure simple analogy around that is you're just shifting load. So load doesn't magically disappear when we run. Remember, most load comes from the fact that we actually run. Um, I have a good friend in Sweden, Martin Aska, who I've run a lot of my running courses at his clinic. He always says to me, the simple course to run is just do the advanced running with training, reduce cadence to zero, and no one gets running injuries. That's the end of the course. It takes us 30 seconds. But what, So we've got to be mindful that that's the case. And if we continue to run, then actually we're going to have running loads. And so we have to work out the safest way to mitigate those. Some other examples of shifting load that you can consider would be you might not change the landing position, so the overall loads might be exactly the same, but you might change your pelvic position slightly. And this is something I play a lot with in clinic, and there's no research evidence. I always flag that when I talk about these things, but certainly adjusting from a really anteriorly tilted position to maybe slightly more neutral position in the pelvis will allow our gluteal muscles and our abdominal muscles to activate a little bit better. And if you don't believe me, I want you to try it next time you go for a walk or have a run and you can stand there and do it now. So that would shift load to those areas instead of maybe being taken more distally or around the knee, and that can be helpful. We might also look at changing the position on impact at the knee. So if you've got a straight knee when you hit the ground, then what's gonna happen is your loads are gonna go through the internal structures of your knee. So if you've got some meniscal irritation or internal joint irritation of the knee, it's not gonna to like to land when your knee's really straight. If you can get just a slight bit of knee flexion when you hit the ground, then those loads are going to start to go into the quadriceps instead when you're absorbing loads through the knee. So it's thinking through strategies like that and thinking about that person's capacity. So if I stick to strike pattern as the example of the S and we move to the K, keep adapting to that person's goals and capacity. So what we need to think about is it might be really sensible to change someone's strike pattern. And I go back to that example of a someone who's got compartment syndrome in the anterior shin, it might be really sensible to get them off their heels and into more of a forefoot, midfoot strike so they can absorb more loads at impact through their calf instead of their tibialis anterior. If we wanted to do that, what we need to sensibly do is build their capacity through their calf over time. So we might do that through an exercise program, starting off with some heavy, slow resistance type exercise, building into some more rate of force development, working to some 
skipping and then hopping and those types of activities. And then over the space of a couple of months, it actually becomes a sensible thing for them to maybe shift their strike pattern. And you start to bring in that shifting concept as well. <clears throat> Equally from the K of keep adapting to that individual person, that person might have a race coming up in four or five weeks, probably not a sensible time for you to start changing their strike pattern or changing anything to do with their running technique for that matter, because you'll probably impair their performance. You might actually cause a new injury. So you probably need to have that conversation with them and say, look, these are some things we can try after you've got through this event and we can try and modify some things because you've had this knee pain for the past 10 years. You've had this shin pain for the past 10 years. And if we modify these things, this will probably help you get out of that muddy water and get back to running and enjoying it but you need a period where you can take a step back from running reduce your loads give us time to improve capacity to absorb loads in other areas and that'll allow us to shift the loads there and then we can build your running back up so if we use that risk that risk concept and think about what we're doing i think it's a really nice way to, to frame all of our interventions gait retraining exercise you can use it for shoes for taping um, and then you can start to really consider how biologically some of the injections many runners have and all these other things they do how they could plausibly actually help and you start to really question them a little bit more as well fantastic so thanks for that um so now we're getting some great questions in from people uh over the q a function i think we'll start with trevor spencer's uh question where he sort of wanted to know when we have an injured runner or walker and they present with low limb pain when would you start to look at changing their gait, such as knee valgus, abduction moments, all those sorts of things? And it probably sort of fits in with Joe Kemp's question as well is, is there a right hip angle for runners to be running at? Yeah, so there's a couple of questions in that. So when is the right time to look at changing mechanics? I think if you've got a long-term injury, um, so this is an injury that keeps coming back despite being sensible with your loading, despite doing good strength and conditioning program, all of those types of things. We know that people who have had a prolonged period of injury, that their mechanics will change. There's very little relationship between running mechanics and risk of injury, but certainly when you've had an injury for a long time, we know someone who's had knee pain for a long time will have more hip adduction. So we see that commonly, particularly in females. So in that circumstance, that might be a sensible patient that you might consider to start changing their mechanics. Now, in someone who's just maybe because of COVID decided they're going to take up running and they haven't done it for 10 years and they've just gone out and started, started running and they've built up far too quickly. They've followed the cats to 5k program. They've got to week four and in week four to week five, you go from five minutes in total of running to 20 minutes in total of running. They've spiked their loads, they've developed a knee pain you probably wouldn't worry about changing the mechanics there. It's more about education around load management. So I think it's very person specific around that. It's more to do with chronicity of injury when you really strongly consider changing mechanics. Let's assume that is a more of a chronic injury and you do want to consider those things and let's use patellofemoral pain as an example. I've gone well away from actually specifically cueing changing hip adduction in internal rotation. So I don't ask people to run and open their knees. Um, I don't ask people to do those types of mechanics because everyone has different structural makeup, which would dictate how much hip adduction. And it's really hard to identify what would be ideal for that person. Remember that bell curve. So everyone's going to be a little bit different and that's hard to assess. What I tend to focus more so on is some sagittal plane things. If you can increase step rate, um, change your impact point, change your pelvic position and if you want to do a little bit of exercise while you're at home here just stand up and do a couple of squats with yourself in anterior pelvic tilt and just see how that feels do a couple of squats with yourself in a more neutral position and see how that feels and what you'll find is by changing that sagittal plane mechanics you'll actually reduce how much hip adduction you get so i would start thinking about some of those things um, and rather than trying to specifically cue that and what's really important to consider around that as well is don't change running mechanics if they don't have the capacity to do that so if i'm going to give someone a cue to maybe go into a bit more posterior pelvic tilt and they have very poor ability to have trunk function in terms of muscle power and strength through their lower abdominal muscles and i might test this with some different plank exercises they might have poor power through their hip so they're not actually able to generate a lot of force let's use a long or short lever bridge as an example and we're looking at some of these things they're really tight in their anterior hips so it's really hard for them to get away from that position that's not a sensible cue for me to give them as well so you need to really consider why that person is running the way they are and if there's barriers there that are stopping them do that whether that's soft tissue tightness or or hypertonicity or whether it's loss of muscle strength and power you need to often address those things either alongside or address them first and then you might start to make some of those changes going forwards 
Great, and then thank you. Just, yes, and just to clarify really importantly as well, we think we're quite clever often when we do our biomechanical assessments and we do all these things. But if you make a change to someone and it makes their pain worse, then stop it. That's really important. So be guided by their symptoms as well. That's the most important thing. And often I think what we do with gait retraining is we provide a few different things for them to try and they'll work out what's best for them and, and they'll play around with it because people just run the way they run and they don't really think about it. And gait retraining, a lot of it is giving them that opportunity to try a few different things and work out what feels best for them as well. That's an important consideration too. Yeah, it's one of those things that you can't really take patient education away from gait retraining and how and how much is education and how much is actual the gait yeah. retraining itself. It's a and, difficult thing to untangle. And, so, and, and I was just going to say, and equally, Sean, you can't take away the exercise part either. So if you do that without considering their muscle capacity, that's also not a good idea. So it's not, I don't think we should disentangle those two things and let's compare gait retraining in a study to exercised which ultimately would make it easy to do gait retraining so yeah it's important yeah. too yeah fantastic i think this is a great opportunity to also now bring in james alexander who i know has been working with you around some infographics about myths specifically yeah. about running so we had a question so james welcome first of all thanks sean i'll just bring my video in yep yeah, brilliant. Great to see. Um, so we've got a question from Patricia Ting, and I think this relates really well to one of your infographics. She says that she read somewhere that there's a lack of conclusive evidence that matching a shoe features around sort of so motion control shoes, that sort of thing. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for it. So is this true? Is there a misconception about these shoes? And if it is true, how should she prescribe uh, the right types of shoes to runners? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question, Sean, and, um, and it is correct. So one of the infographics that we, um, that we did, um, and this has been published on the LASM blog website, was, was around um, runners believing that wearing the wrong shoe for your foot type causes injury. Um, and so what we unpacked with this um, running-related myth was that, um, yes, in fact, that there is no conclusive evidence that um, you know, fitting a shoe, say, with stability features to, to someone who pronates or, or rolls in a lot during their running gait, or likewise to someone who has quite a neutral or high arch foot type um, and, and, and prescribing more neutral shoe um, reduces their injury risk. Um, and so, yeah, that we kind of kind of busted that myth with um, through that infographic. So, um, you know, coming back to prescribing shoes um look i think it um and christian might comment a little bit more on this I, I think it comes back just to more um comfort and not making a significant change to what the runners used to so um and and that comes back with shifting load um in, into christian's principles that he discussed before so for example if someone's used to running in in a, in a in more of a stability shoe with quite a significant heel to to four foot drop of maybe 10 to 12 mil making a significant change and putting them in more of a minimalist shoe will shift that load and, and can increase their um, injury risk in the short term. Um, so, yeah. Just... Yeah, so it's sort of all that sort of time that I've been running up and down the middle of a footlocker to see if the shoes are comfortable is probably the best thing I can do to figure out whether I've got the right shoe or not. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, comfort's very important. And then and coming back in to, to not making a significant change to, to what the person's used to. Um, so, you know, shoes can facilitate or assist to facilitate some of the changes that Christian's been, that been discussing, um, but it's just kind of one part of the picture and, and, and changes have to be made gradually. Fantastic. So thanks for that, James. And uh, Christian, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's, I think that's really important. I think the thing we've always got to remember is the body hates rapid change. Um, so we're living structure and we adapt to those changing stresses, but they need to be gradually introduced, whether that's training volume, shoes, whatever it might be, it hates rapid change. So a big change to your, your footwear suddenly going from a stability shoe to a minimalist shoe and not changing your training volume is, is really not sensible. And that's what gets a lot of people injured. Equally, the body seems to also like a variation of training as well. So I think that's important. So variation of different shoe types can sometimes be beneficial for some people. Um, and if you see a lot of people who do heavy amounts of training, I'd be interested to ask you, James, because you're absolutely smashing this on the Strava minus Richie. Um, what do you, you wear a few different shoes when you run? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I would, um, 
do, yeah, I have, I guess, more minimalist or lighter, faster shoes for, for sessions. Um, so intervals or fart leg type running. And then, um, you yeah, know, more of a, more of a neutral to, to supportive type shoe for the slower running. And, and then there's trail running shoes as well. So, you know, you can look at our front door and see 15 different pairs of, of <laughs> shoes. So, yeah, we are varying a lot. Right, he's good. Fantastic. So it's probably actually a good time for us to Irish up our coffee and get Richie, uh, Richard Johnston involved, uh, who's a, again a postdoctoral researcher at um, at the centre. So Richie, we've st- spoken a little bit about training loads, other factors that might increase risk of injury or running related injuries. You've recently done a bit of work and a lot of your PhD focused on this. So I was wondering if you could share some of the insights about what are some of the factors that increase the risk of injury? Good morning, Sean, and thanks for inviting me along to happy hour. Um, From my own experience and just from uh, dipping my toe into the running as well too, um, I like to be... I like to be collaborative with um, a runner as well too to get a good idea about what does their actually weekly running load look like um, and how they actually paint the picture and what they feel their running load looks like and what we find um, when I conducted my own research was um, low to moderate training loads within a week had a reduced risk in running injury. So not specifically around a particular joint, but just how they subjectively reported um, injury or pain. And just as we discussed more of what a running load looks like for a week, um, in particular, like within my own training and reading more into training loads and understanding how, what does a training load look like? Um, models such as Stephen uh, Sillier's, um, in particular, looking at an 80-20 model in particular, so 80% of your running load in that week um, would be lighter sessions, so easy volume, easy pace, conversational runs. So that reflects that low to moderate training load. And then the other 20% would be focused more around if you're going to potentially get your run if your runners doing, as James described there, an interval session or a workout. So they're up in the gears a little bit. And it's does the runner have the capacity to adapt um, to that model essentially? And that's kind of that's what I like to work off. But then also we must consider when we look at the athlete themselves, it's not just the training load. We need to look in the background. So um, from a other context of lifestyle and psychological as well too. So we also try to identify um, anything weekly going on within the runner as well too during my own research, in particular sleep. So we monitored sleep. Um, week to week um, over a longitudinal period when we track the training loads of an endurance uh, population and we identified that just the runner or the population being able to just track their daily sleep patterns so just reporting a number to it so anything that was less than seven hours per night um, you're likely to increase your your uh, injury or pain reporting in the following week um, uh, of your training. Whereas if you had more than seven hours, seven hours of uh, sleep in the week before, you're more than likely gonna reduce, um, have reduced pain experiences in the following week. Brilliant, this sort of that consideration of the athlete as a whole, not just their training loads, it's just so important, not only in running related injuries, but so many of our other conditions. And um, like, I think the key thing, like being, working in a uh, physio practice as well too, it's important to listen to the runner as well, as much as we can, like what does their week look like? And um, when they break it down, not just from what they're training, because you've got to, like as runners, it's built in around life, so work, families, and they're trying to uh, put sessions in. So either it's early doors, first thing in the morning, or late in the evening after work, where there's so many things you need to consider. So it's trying to manage that as best we can and um, tailoring it to the individual that you're working with. Fantastic. So, Christian, I think back to you. We've got a great question from Manuela Molina. Um, 
over the Q&A and she asked, what do you think the mechanism of effectiveness behind strengthening programs is? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, is it effective is the first question. I don't know that we have um, great evidence that strengthening programs is effective compared to not strengthening programs for running populations. Um, I think one of the barriers we have for a lot of that research is that if you're truly going to give someone a strengthening program, you need to do it for a long period of time. So we're talking 12 weeks plus and there's just not RCTs that exist looking at that. So most strength programs that you look at in the literature, two things, they're short. And the other thing is they're often not dosed adequately to actually induce longer term strength changes. So they might improve neuromuscular function, um, which would allow us to generate more force with isometric testing, etc. But they're not actually dosed high enough that that would lead to any muscle hypertrophy or any sustained changes. So let's assume that they are effective. And I've put my clinical hat on for a second and certainly Anecdotally, people participating in long-term strength training programs tend to do much better. Um, and I think a big part of that has to do with they're probably adhering to everything I'm telling them. So it might actually be the education and the load management that's actually helping them. But that's another thing um, as well. But in terms of the actual mechanism of why strength might help, I think if you load tissues heavily, you can build um, capacity for them to tolerate loads as well. So you're going to reduce sensitization. So that could be an element of why heavy strength training might be helpful. Um, in terms of the simple analogy I often use with patients is why would we want someone with patellofemoral pain to do strength work on their quadriceps? And A, it's building tolerance in the patellofemoral joint, but B, it's also building capacity of your quadriceps muscles to actually absorb loads adequately. Why would I do hip strength work? A lot of people get very focused on the mechanics that we might change knee valgus, for example, but we know that doing strength work doesn't do that for people with patellofemoral pain. You need to actually change gait. And the most likely scenario I see of it, why it helps is you're actually able to absorb load more through your hip and take more load through your hip, which means less load on your patellofemoral joint. So that's going to be quite useful. So that could be part of the mechanism. What I encourage people to do clinically, and I do this a lot with my patients, is don't just stop at strength. We have running, which is an activity of high rate of force development requirements. So you have the average recreational run of 0.3 of a second, your foot's in contact with the ground. That gives you about 0.1 of a second to absorb loads. So you need to not only look at strength, but also rate of force development and muscle power. And so we see really good outcomes. I'll use Igor Sancho's study recently published for Achilles. And yeah, they did some strength programs, but actually the main focus of that intervention in Achilles tendinopathy was a jumping and then hopping program, which they were doing within, within a month. Most of them were doing hopping-based rehab. And so they're working more so on muscle power. So that might build load tolerance in the Achilles, but equally it might also start to develop better ability to have load absorption and we see things like stiffness um, which might also help with why an SNC program works so long answer we don't have the the, um, the clear answers on that and I think it depends on the condition and, and the person but I think it's probably a combination of psychology a combination of better load and tissue capacity locally in an area that might be sensitized and also better muscle function to actually absorb loads and, and run better as well i think there's multiple factors that could explain it but we need to do some decent trials to do proper strength training programs in runners and i'd love to see that happen but no one likes funding running research unfortunately we're definitely talking about complex interventions especially when you piece it together with all your risk acronym and yeah. there's, there's so many factors to it it's not as simple as a drug trial yeah. um a question from Diana Gary, who asked over email, what are the best exercises or drills to do uh, for someone who's beginning to run for exercise and hasn't done it for a, in the past or for a very long time? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Like we don't have science to support doing anything. Um, so that's a, a challenging one. I think probably the best exercise you can do pre prepare for running is, is walking. So actually getting some load tolerance happening. So I think if someone's really sedentary, then just going straight into running is maybe not a sensible thing. So you might want to build that through walking. Um, and then I think just doing some general exercise to work on some muscle strength might be helpful as well. Um, Again, if we go back to that concept of rate of force development, once you've done maybe, let's call it a month or six weeks of doing some heel raises, some squats not going too deep, doing some lunges and maybe some bridges, so some global exercises, I think it's probably really sensible to start to build some rate of force development capacity. And you might do that through some simple exercises like skipping um, and then maybe working towards hopping. And so if someone's been sedentary for a long time, you might want to spend the first couple of months working on those things and a bit of a walking program and then gradually introduce running from there would be my usual approach, um, especially if someone's got a history of injuries in the past too. Fantastic. 
So I think we've got the last question just because we don't want to take up too much of your time. But the last question I suppose is from Sasha and she was asking if your process is shifting load from heel to forefoot mechanics and a runner, would you also recommend altering the curing during exercise for these clients to emphasize exerting more load through the forefoot through the forefoot? And I suppose um, question for you and James. Yeah. So queuing for a specific therapeutic exercise, you mean? Is that what we're getting at? Yes. Um, yeah. So I think, um, again, if you're going to do a sh shift in load, you need to build the capacity first. I think that's really important. You don't need to give cues to do heel raises to get your calf strong. You might want to focus on a few things like pushing through your big toe and trying to normalize the movement patterns there. But most of it's about building the capacity as opposed to specific cueing. There are cases um, with exercise where let's say I want to build up um, gluteal or, or lower abdominal muscle strength and power. I wouldn't just start smashing people with doing um, things like hip thrusters um, because let's say that they've got a chronic history of, of knee problems and there's not a lot of strength and power through their gluteal muscles and they're generating a lot of that drive through the hamstrings. We know that might increase patellofemoral joint stress. So I'd use a lot of cueing in the early stages to work on some motor control and make sure that when they're doing, say, a bridge exercise or a hip thruster exercise, they start off doing it with slow controlled movements and they're actually feeling the load through their gluteal muscles but usually you can progress from that within a couple of weeks and then working towards more strength and power. We actually published a paper which has got a nice appendix about this exercise approach um, a couple of years ago, or might have even been last year in patellofemoral pain where we actually pushed them through strength and power exercises. So you can see the logic that we went through to do that. So we can certainly make sure we, we share that. So that would be, be my approach. In terms of drills, um, I used to use lots of running drills after being exposed to running coaches. These days I don't really use them very much. What I typically do is focus on isolated capacity for particular muscles and tissues and be really therapeutic with my exercise prescription using mechanotherapy type concepts. And then the functional exercise I use is running. So just if we're going to work on running and change running, I'll focus more so on running. I don't know if James has anything to add to that. Yeah, I suppose, again, James, in that sort of debunking myth series, one of them was around the transition from rear to forefoot. So anything to add? Um, look, I think just, just further to what Christian said, um, you know, with that building capacity, just understanding if, if you are looking at shifting, um, from a rear foot to a forefoot strike and, and look, I think from, from the recent systematic review and the infographic that we did, that's only recommended, um, if you're looking to, to change it for a therapeutic reason. So to, to shift load. So for the uninjured runner, um, who runs with a rear foot strike, there's kind of currently no evidence that would suggest it's beneficial from an injury prevention or performance to shift in the first place. Um, for building capacity, I think obviously the, the calf um, work that needs to be done is um, prior to that transition is really important, but just understanding how much load the calf muscles have to absorb through the running cycle. And that can be anywhere between six to eight times the body weight. So ensuring that your exercise prescription is progressed sufficiently enough. So beyond body weight calf raises, well beyond body weight calf raises, I, I would say. So ben, yeah, fantastic. So Christian, last question for me to sort of summarize what we've been talking about today. And so again, thank you so much for your time. Um, we've spoken about uh, sort of a number of approaches and gait retraining is a complex intervention. So do you, if for the clinician who's wanting to put gait retraining into their toolbox to, as an intervention, what is your number one tip for those thinking about approaching gait retraining for people with lower limb pain? Yeah. So number one tip is to make sure what you do do, the person can actually achieve, whether that's strike pattern, um, which can be more dangerous, step rate, you need to make sure they've got muscle power and capacity to increase their step rate, so rate of force development. So not changing something they're not capable of actually changing is really important. And think carefully about that. And if in doubt, probably don't change it and maybe work with some people who've done a lot more of this in, in, in the space. Um, so either that be colleagues or whether that be reaching out and contacting researchers, get along to courses, et cetera, and learn more about it before you start changing a lot of things related to gait, because it can be therapeutic as James was just suggesting, but it can also be very detrimental and create new injuries and first do no harm.
Fantastic. And when we upload this uh, video and onto the Laysom blog, we'll be sure to include some resources and some papers for people who want to uh, yeah. get into great retraining. So, Christian, thanks so much for your time today. I think all the panellists, uh, all the attendees would have found this really useful and it was um, great to hear your insights. No, my pleasure. And I think there's still a few questions that were really good that were written down. So I think we'll make sure we get some answers out to people as well regarding some of those two at a later date. Yeah. It'll be good. Yeah, and we'll be, like I said, like Christian said, we'll keep your eyes out for, we'll probably do a follow-up to try and cover off some of these questions. Uh, make sure you look at the Laysom, uh the SEMRC blog for at La Trobe. Uh, we constantly update information and it's a great resource for you uh, to keep up to date with everything that we're doing at the centre. Um, lastly also, but we, we are doing some research specifically in runners and looking at injury risk. So Richard Johnson, I was wondering if you'd uh, want to plug the research and sort of give an overview of what you're doing and sort of the participants that you're looking to recruit. Thanks, Sean. Um, so the last group were collaboratively working together to set up a project called Trail, which is looking at a group of runners over a longitudinal period to collect running data. Um, at the beginning, we're currently in the planning stage at the minute, uh, and we're hopefully about to launch soon. But uh, once uh, we recruit participants, the EA and we're allowed back on site. The plan is to get uh, the runners into um, the university do some biomechanics tests in the gate lab and look at the running style um, over force plates and then also look at other measures as well too so assessing strength and vertical hop and um, the overall plan is to recruit runners who have had a history of knee surgery and we're also going to uh, recruit runners who haven't had a history of knee surgery so it's fairly interesting space and ideas to collect the their running data over a longitudinal period, and then again repeat um, the baseline tests at uh, at the end of the two-year period. We're also aiming to gather MRIs and imaging of uh, the the cohorts that have had a history of knee surgery as well too. So, and that will give us an idea of what their knee looks like and um, before they start the study. So it's very exciting, and we're also a we're close to launching and um, we're just currently um, uh, in, the, in the setup at the minute. Fantastic. And probably the best place is to contact, to Google your name and Latrobe yeah. and get in contact with you. If anybody is interested and has uh, is looking to get on board, just contact me directly um, and uh, I'll be able to provide any information. Fantastic. Well, uh, again, thank you, Christian, Richard, and James for all of your insights today. Uh, when we end this meeting, uh, you will be, uh, you as the attendees will be taken to a survey to sort of get some brief information about yourself, but also what you liked and what you didn't like about this session. And this is really useful for us to make sure this is the best, most informative product we can, because we, we really want this to be useful for you, the attendees, and you, your information will help us do that. Um, for all other information about some of the really fun things that our centre are doing, uh, follow our Facebook page. There's some really good um, exercise tips in there and something that's worthwhile looking at. Um, also follow our Twitter page, as well as have a look at the SEMRC blog for a whole bunch of resources and information. So, Again, thank you very much. Look after yourselves in these interesting times and we hope to see you at our next happy hour or catch up coffee. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy everyone. Thanks, Sean.